look at me. This is me three years ago, arguing with people on Facebook over live feeding and about how frozen thought is clearly the most ethical choice. What I should have done is investigate this on a deeper level. So that is what we're doing together in this video. I'm going to take you down the rabbit hole because the answers to all of this are not so black and white. So the first thing we need to establish here is what is a humane death? Well, this has three components, minimising pain, minimising distress and minimising the duration of the process to limit suffering. You know, to understand these two deaths, we must actually understand the process in detail. Come look at this. So I've been researching through the literature on CO2 gassing and rodents. You'll see it spans decades. Researchers have been questioning how valid CO2 really is as a humane euthanasia method. The common method for euthanizing rodents of CO2 is called a slow rising bath. Levels of CO2 in the chamber slowly rise until the rodent falls unconscious. Then past unconsciousness, at this point welfare isn't really a problem because the rodent isn't really aware of what's happening and then the rodent dies of asphyxiation. Now research on the use of CO2 somewhat varies but the common theme throughout is that CO2 is incredibly aversive to both mice and rats. One paper assessed for aversion. The paper used albino rats and offered them a dual chambered cage. One chamber was brightly lit as it is well documented that light is extremely aversive to albino rats. The other chamber was pitch black which the rats preferred. Now the hypothesis was that if CO2 filled the dark chamber and the rats truly were unaware of it then they would remain in the chamber until unconsciousness. What happened was that when the dark chamber began to fill, all rats left the chamber and exposed themselves to the light, showing that CO2 was aversive to the rats. Apart from a list of papers as long as my arm showing distress and aversion to CO2, an international group of researchers and stakeholders met at Newcastle University in 2013. They met to discuss the latest research and which method could be considered the most humane. The meeting agreed that CO2 across a large range of peer-reviewed studies using a range of species, strains and testing methods, we see a consistent trend that CO2 is incredibly aversive to rats and mice at levels far lower than what's actually needed to induce unconsciousness. And because of this, it was agreed that a refinement method to CO2 should be sought after. Carbon dioxide actually induces fear responses and fear behaviour in mice at levels around 5-10% to such as freezing behaviour, which to the casual observer can actually be misinterpreted as a peaceful reaction or a non-reaction at all, when in actuality it's an indicator of severe distress. So no, no matter what you do, it's incredibly distressful to the rodents, even if it doesn't necessarily cause pain. The meeting summarised that exposure to CO2 above certain concentrations is likely to cause pain. When CO2 enters the mucous membrane when inhaled, carbonic acid is formed and decreases the intercellular pH, which may selectively excite primary afferent nutty receptors. CO2, time depending, activates pain related neurons in the medullary dorsal horn. Now the nosy receptors in rodents is actually similar to humans, at a similar density in their nasal and ocular epithelia. So human experimentation may actually be used as an indicator to what levels may cause pain in rats and mice. In human volunteers, CO2 was inhaled nasally for a single breath at different concentrations. Now bear in mind all concentrations were frequently described as burning, but not all concentrations were described as painful. CO2 was described as painful at concentrations of around 50% and increased with concentrations of CO2. With a fill rate of 20% chamber volume per minute, rats lose consciousness at around 156 seconds, at which point the concentrations of CO2 is 39%, which is likely to be before the gas reaches levels liable to cause pain. So if this process is done correctly then it's probable that the rodents don't feel pain. But it's not necessarily a guarantee. If done incorrectly it's the case of just turning the valve on a CO2 canister and just letting it just flow in without even thinking about concentrations and calculations per fill rate or anything like that then yeah that, that's going to be painful. Now another consideration is that rodents are extremely empathic towards each other. So what one feels 
another one feels too. So they're distressed by the distress of others. But when the opposite rodent to them is a stranger, we don't tend to see the same result. But our suppliers making sure that these rodents they're gassing in the chamber together don't know each other? I don't know. Otherwise, it's a group of aversive rodents, all feeding off of each other's distress, all amping each other up in a state of panic before they finally become unconscious. While CO2 gassing can be somewhat standardised, the death of a live-fed rodent is just incredibly variable. Now, if we just stick to constriction, because I think that represents the largest majority of pet snakes, then the ability of the snake to actually kill a rodent quickly is determined by the age of the snake, the skill of the snake, the cognitive development of the snake, the species of snake, the size of the snake compared to the rodent. You get my point, it's just, it's so variable. Constricted rodents actually reach unconsciousness faster than those under CO2. This is because it's not only asphyxiation at play here, but immediate circulatory and cardiac arrest. Now, simulated constriction of live mice killed them in as little as 42 seconds. And the brown tree snake killed a domestic mouse via constriction in as little as 50 seconds. Now compare those 40 and 50 seconds to the two and a half minutes it takes for rodents to fall unconscious under the influence of CO2. Now the question here is, is it better to die a death that is distressful and may take longer but may or may not include pain than a death that is distressful, definitely includes pain but is over far quicker. I would like to propose to you a welfare dilemma shown in an EASA welfare seminar. It's for goldfish, but it is comparable, and for our purposes, I would like to write my own. So you have to pick out of these two scenarios, what would you prefer? Now, this is the live feeding scenario. The mice are housed in appropriate social groups and have enrichment objects, are raised following current accepted welfare standards for mice. These mice are kept by the snake keeper and one single mouse is taken when needed and dropped into the snake's enclosure. The snake constricts the mouse and it is dead in 45 seconds, but those 45 seconds involve fear and pain. Now our frozen thawed scenario, the mice are housed in typical rodent racks with no enrichment in high density groups. There may or may not be some squabbling among conspecifics. These mice are taken and placed into a chamber with members of the same group. CO2 begins to slowly rise in the chamber. These mice are distressed because they sense the CO2. The distress and panic is felt among the group. Air hunger is expressed throughout the group as well as anxiety and fear for a full two and a half minutes before they lose consciousness. Now remember what I said at the beginning, a humane death is about minimising pain, minimising distress and minimising the duration of the process to limit suffering. Well, CO2 gassing and live feeding causes distress. CO2 gassing, when done properly via a rising bath, does seem to minimise pain, but it is a drawn out process. But live feeding minimises the duration of the process. Let's say the person isn't doing a rising CO2 bath and is simply just turning the valve on a CO2 canister. Then that process would cause distress, pain, and take longer than live feeding to a constrictor. Now suddenly the lines are blurred. And if you're like me, I imagine you're feeling rather conflicted about the whole thing. Okay, so let's say that the long-term care for these rodents in either scenario is the same. And let's say that the person is doing this properly via a rising CO2 bath. Then I personally would choose CO2 because I would choose distress and a probable lack of pain, even if it does take longer, over distress and definite pain even if that's quicker. My personal thoughts are, if your snake will eat frozen thawed, but you feed live for enrichment, then fair enough. But if you're keeping that very same snake in a non-enriching environment, then how much do you really care for enrichment? So I think the answer to, is it more ethical to feed frozen thawed or live, is, it depends.